grateful to Seth and Max for what they've created. And especially without knowing you guys, I'm gonna expect that you will think I'm a little bit less crazy than a lot of other audiences would think <laughs> that I am crazy. So I'm gonna assume that, uh, you know, I won't be lynched at the end of this, but if so, you know, let's try to have fun doing it. Um, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give... Me first. There we go. That's my wife, got way, and she's a tough cookie. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of a bio, then I'll explain Radical Social Entrepreneurs, Strong's Law, and then I will explain a little bit about the projects I'm going in, and we'll open up the conversation, and hopefully we'll have all the world's problems solved before you guys get too drunk this evening. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I think just because my background is a little bit strange, uh, I, I really started out in a core, so my core identity is probably as education entrepreneur. I've created lots of schools. I love to create schools. I've helped people create schools. Um, if anybody here wants to create a school, I'll help you create a school. I'm just, you know, a promiscuous school starter. starter. So, uh, let's do it all the time. Um, on weekends, I call people and we're talking about creating schools somewhere. So I started out, Joe, though, with a high school class in which we, instead of regular school, we would read and discuss ideas. So my high school uh, teacher would read, have us read Plato, Buber, Nietzsche, and we just talked about it. And I loved it. I thought, wow, this is fun. My parents were uneducated. My mom's a high school dropout. My dad, an elevator repairman. Um, I just accepted school, because that's what you do. And then we started talking about ideas. Wow, this is fun and cool. So then I heard about a small college called St. John's. There's one in Annapolis, Maryland, one in Santa Fe, New Mexico. For four years, all you do is read and talk about ideas. Mm -hmm. I loved it, but then I had good test scores. My high school counselor said, look, you can go to Harvard, and then you can still study Plato and French and whatever. I went to Harvard, boring people talking at me. So I left <laughs> Harvard because I don't like being talked at. I always feel guilty when I talk at people, so I'll, you know, I'll forgive myself for this little 45 minute stretch. Um, but then I went to St. John's, spent four years, had a lot of fun, just loved it. Uh, from there, I went to graduate school in Chicago. While I was in graduate school, I started leading Socratic seminars in Chicago public schools. And one of my one of the people I worked with said, sometimes it's like pouring gasoline on the table and putting a match when kids are ready for ideas. And not, they're not always. Sometimes discussions go horribly. But sometimes kids are so ready for ideas that it's magic and fun to give them the opportunity to talk. So I did that the very first time I led one in the Chicago public school, you know, inner city and everything. The kids were on fire. They were so excited. And so I had a good start. And then later when it was tough and I was getting punched in the gut because the kids weren't interested, I was ready to kind of deal with that. Anyway, from Chicago, I went to Alaska where I trained teachers in Socratic seminars. So this is well, without ever having an education um, degree or a course or a credential of any kind, I was training teachers full time to lead Socratic seminars. We were on soft money, so when the uh, grant money ran out, some parents loved what we were doing and they asked me to start a school in Anchorage. So again, with no experience, I was now starting a private school. I was clueless. I knew kind of what to do in the classroom, but I had no idea, oh, the teachers have to get paid. How does that happen? <laughs> so um, kind of accident, accidental entrepreneur. From there, I was asked to uh, create a Montessori high school in San Antonio for what was then the Judson Montessori School. They weren't quite ready, so I ended up Socratizing the pre-K through eight. Um, I actually lead Socratic seminars with five-year-olds. Um, I actually have a, a weekly Sunday show where I lead a five-year-old in Socratic seminars. So we're gonna see a five-year-old really thinking hard. She's just amazing. She's a, a, an amazing human being. Um, while I did that, I also wrote a book, The Habit of Thought from Socratic Seminars to Socratic Practice about classroom Socratic dialogue. I led hundreds of workshops across the US on how to do this in public, private, parochial schools and later around the world. I was asked to create a school for highly gifted children in South Florida, where we were having sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students pass advanced placement courses. Then I went to Palo Alto and created Montessori Middle Schools for the um, Early Learning Institute, which had, which had campuses in Palo Alto and Pleasanton. I then created a school in Angel Fire, New Mexico. Charter High School was named the 36th best public high school in the US in its third year. Um, then I met John Mackey of Whole Foods. John had created this grocery store. I'd created a bunch of little schools. He and I both believed in entrepreneurship to make the world a better place. So we created something called Flow that is to create entrepreneurial solutions for world problems. Out of that spawn off conscious capitalism and peace through commerce and radical social entrepreneurs and startup uh, cities institute and uh, probably something else. They're just you know, <laughs> you know, churning out these nonprofits. 
Um, and then a couple of years ago, uh, I had served on the board of the Cabelli School, um, now Headwaters Academy, where Lexier Cabelli, uh, also known as Coach of Cabelli, had been a co-founder. He and I had stayed in touch. You know, he's from Lesotho. I had at that point married Magat, so we both had African connections. We talked about schools, uh, creating schools in Africa. It turned out to be a good time for him, he and I to create a school. So four years ago, I created what used to be Cabelli Strong Incubator, now co-school at Casa de Luz. It's upstairs. It's Integrity Academy downstairs. And uh, as of this fall, I am starting with an organization that's creating a school in San Francisco based on the co-school model. It's by the most successful Montessori chain in the US, and they see a, this as a Montessori high school model. Um, so it's a gorgeous building near the Presidio, four stories, 1920s building, and I'm flying back and forth to recruit students. Magat and I moved in January. So uh, it's actually great, Seth, you can have me before I you know, disappear from the Austin scene for a while. Um, I move all over the place, so who knows how long. Um, so, you know, when Seth says I do a lot of things, that's sort of the short version. Um, <laughs> that, that's missing a lot of bells and whistles. Um, Question before you go. Yeah, go for it. So, I'm a pretty rock star of like, um, all, it seems mm -hmm. magical of, here's this guy, I don't, you know, standing here, having wine with us, who suddenly, the, it looks like the doors just opened for you magically, but what was the work behind that of being the, this, doing something that was radical, it seemed like. Right. I mean, Socrates has been around forever. Right, right. But uh, bringing it into schools and all these opportunities, it's only like, wow, you had all these, did they just, were you, um, what did the marketing look like for that? Or how you did you get that, invited to all this stuff? Yeah, that's, that's great. You on the phone all the question, time? Thank you. Know. So I would say by accident, um, I'll make a connection that's made sense to me. In the 1990s, there was an article about business in Business Week that said that Whole Foods won because uh, health food stores in the 1970s were run by moralizing hippies that tried to tell us that carob tastes like chocolate. <laughs> carob does not taste like chocolate. Um, Whole Foods gave us healthy and natural foods along with gourmet wine, gourmet chocolate, you know, yummy goodies. Somewhat analogously, in the world uh, of alternative education, and this is especially important in secondary education, or a world of education generally, there's a kind of high-end, you know, sort of tight-ass prep schools like St. Stephen's, and then they're kind of hippie schools, do whatever you want. And my niche, by accident, became I'm very intellectual. I, you know, I, I read and think all the time. And so by accident, I developed a niche in terms of intellectually high-end alternative education. And I think it's fair to say, um, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is my dissertation in Chicago was under Nobel laureate Gary Becker. Um, I, I am as, in, you know, not to brag, but I, I will exhaust any time a kid thinks that they know something, I'll, you know, exhaust them. So I can, I can take anybody to whatever intellectual heights. That's a little bit un, unusual. I would say in some people in the alternative education world got there because they were damaged by conventional education and can sometimes be even anti-academic or anti-intellectual. So anytime a, somebody was looking for, um, you know, alternative but high-end, especially at the secondary level, uh, I am the intellectual high-end of alternative secondary education. You know, and so I write, speak, talk all the time and people find me. Right now, um, you know, about twice a month, sometimes more than that, some parents somewhere around the world will reach out to me and say, what do I do with my kid? Um, I'm actually holding a Saturday call, if you know any kids who don't know where to go, um, for kids that want an original path out of schooling. But one of these kids, uh, she's a seventh grade, now an eighth grade girl in Michigan who is too advanced mathematically, and the public schools were penalizing her for it. And so her parents called me and said, Michael, what do we do? Um, one of the prospective students in San Francisco is a 10th grader who has a full-time job as a software developer for a startup. His company just hired a um, Columbia University CS graduate, and the 10th grader is managing the Columbia University CS graduate. <laughs> and meanwhile, he's going to public school, and public schools are dinging him. So, you know, there are kids like this around the world. What do you do with them, you know? And, um, what, do you mean, what do you mean when you say they're being penalized? for? So in this particular case, um, you know, they're only, it's a little bit complicated and bureaucracies are complicated. So when she had gotten into pre-calculus as a seventh grader and there was no place in the boxes for middle school math to say, oh, this is what happens when you do pre-calculus. So they wanted her to stop doing it and maybe to go back and take lower levels of math. And then the question of how many credits was she really earning and was she earning the right number of credits? And, Bureaucratic insanity. It's like a one size fits all mentality. Exactly. You don't the box like exactly. And, and actually, one of the ways I talk about conventional schooling is it's like a, an operating system where uh, the Carnegie credit system 
with a more dominant market share than Microsoft ever had in the 90s. Uh, you know, basically everybody thinks this is what 10th grade biology looks like, this is what 9th grade history looks like, and if you're not doing that, and one of the reasons CoSchool is not accredited, I'm kind of against even becoming accredited because, anyway, I might do it, it's, you know, it is convenient, some parents freak out if you're not, but the accreditation agencies want to know what our ninth grade curriculum is. I have no idea what our ninth graders are. You know, <laughs> I know you're interesting, you're interesting, you're interesting, what grade? I have no idea, it just doesn't matter. Um, you know, so there are all these boxes that force you to follow bureaucracies, and sometimes they're insidious. There's a whole history of uh, innovative school leaders where they come in with this amazing idea, and then five years later, 10 years after the charismatic founder uh, leaves, it all goes back to the norm. Mm -hmm. And I, I know of you know, half a dozen stories of really visionary schools that were started in the 60s, 70s, 80s. After the you know, founder left, then everybody else just follows the you want to be a professional, don't you? you want to be a professional? And the whole world of this is what it means to be an education professional. So I, both Montessori and Waldorf have their own certification systems, their own training systems, their own curriculum. Sudbury Valley as well, so I'm very interested in Reggio Emilia. These systems have kind of whole alternative structures. You can think of it as different operating systems. Um, so great questions. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and be linear and then we can go deep on it. Uh, so yeah. And I'm gonna go back, back and be abstract because I love ideas, and then we'll go back and see how this connects to education. So when John and I, Mackie and I got uh, together, basically, yeah, um, micro-entrepreneurship was cool. Everybody knew about Grameen Bank and so forth. The whole, the whole notion of tech entrepreneurship changing the world was well known. Um, there was a general sense that entrepreneurs can make a difference. And you know, in thinking through this, you know, eventually wanted to go to the root of the problems. You know, some things um, are not gonna make a real big difference. Uh, also, definitely social mission. I'm a hopeless do-gooder. You know, I wake up all day. You know, Saturday and Sunday mornings, my God, drives my God crazy. I wake up and have all these calls with people around the world. I'm nonstop. Um, but yeah, entrepreneurial <laughs> solutions. So just to go into the startup cities thing, which seems completely unrelated, if you look at why poor countries are poor, there's a lot of evidence that basically it's bad legal institutions. It's not bad, um, flawed, mis you know, messed up. We can pick an adjective. Uh, I am. Um, don't not, not yet choose my words too carefully. See if Seth is filming me, see what kind of offensive words I could put out there. Uncensored, but, Michael. Okay, good, good. Yeah, but, you know, if you look at North Korea, South Korea, East Germany, West Germany, you know, same culture, different legal institutions, or the U.S.-Mexican border. Somebody, you know, an unskilled person crossing the border from Mexico into the U.S. Um, can see their income go up 10x, and the cost of living is not 10x. So if we could walk across a line and your income goes up 10x, hello, you do it. Um, meanwhile, there are things a lot of people are not familiar with. So in the US, if you want to get a document notarized, you go to your bank, it's free, your realtor or whatever, it's not a big deal. Maybe somebody will charge you five bucks in a bad day. In Mexico and most of the civil law countries, that is former Spanish, Portuguese, French colonies, which is most of the world, it can cost 500 to to $1,000 to get a document notarized. So what we don't realize is that ordinary mom and pop simple entrepreneurship, which quite aside from fancy tech entrepreneurship, you know, in the U.S. a lot of us have a cousin who you know started a restaurant or bought a hotel or a dry cleaning business. It's all this banal entrepreneurship where at some point in the U.S. you know you're legal and you pay taxes, you have insurance, you get credit, all those systems. Fernando de Soto is famous. He wrote a book called The Mystery of Capitalism for showing that most of the developing world, most people in the developing world, don't have access to the legal system because it's ridiculously hard to create legal businesses. Um, again, I met my wife, Magat, because I was preaching this sort of thing. She's from Senegal, and we talk about how it's like swimming through molasses to get anything done in Senegal. It's impossibly difficult. And so why are poor countries poor? Poor countries are poor because of really crappy legal systems. Um, then the question is, okay, now what? <laughs> because they're not easy to fix. It's really not easy to fix. Turns out that um, although zones, import zones, export processing zones, special economic zones, don't necessarily have a good reputation, and certainly some of them have had bad things happen to them in them, nonetheless, zones have brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. So the biggest example is in China. The Chinese special economic zones have literally brought about 700 million people dramatically out of poverty. The average urban wage in China 20 years ago was about $1,000 a year. Now it's about $6,000 a year. Um, about 700 million urban Chinese. So if you imagine 
not just you know doubling your income, uh, but six x your income over twenty years. You know, if we could do that in Africa, that would be a home run. Much of Africa is still about a thousand dollars per year, and between a thousand dollars per year to six thousand dollars per year, dramatic improvements in health, infant mortality, literacy rates, just about everything good uh, happens rapidly when you go from super poor to merely you know already they're calling the Chinese. Uh, middle class at $6,000 per year. We, we probably wouldn't call it middle class, but compared to what it used to be. Um, but zones are a little bit of a challenge because you still, even if uh, there's some special rules, you still typically have the same government legal system. So Dubai did something interesting in 2002. They created a zone with British common law within 110 acres. And so in these 110 acres, instead of being subject to Sharia law, which is not friendly to finance. Uh, they said, well, let's just install, and this is my 2012 talk, this, they just installed a new legal system where you actually have contracts adjudicated by a British, um, experienced British judge, commercial law judge, uh, according to British common law. So they saw that London is great uh, financial capital, as are other places that run common law, including New York, Chicago, Sydney, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So they just imported it, and now Dubai is a top 20 financial center. This was so successful that Abu Dhabi copied exactly the same model. Now Abu Dhabi has a little zone with its own British common law legal center. So they too can attract finance, financial capital. So if you generalize that, I think how can we put little zones with higher quality law and governance around the world? So one of the, the next stages I'm taking this, this is actually new since 2012, is um, e-government. So Estonia is, that's why I'm interested in this map, going to Estonia. Estonia is probably the world e-government headquarters. One of the great things about e-government is everything's efficient. And the whole idea is let's have government be as efficient as the best businesses. And not that all uh, businesses are perfect, or e-government's perfect, but you know, every time I go to the DMV, you know, it's this long, slow, strange process. Whereas uh, you know, when, when you wanna do something online, it's almost instantaneous. So at this point, why can't we have everything instantaneous? Um, Estonia and other e-government headquarters are leaning in that direction, moving towards that direction. We actually have a mayor of a town in Senegal who's supportive of having this town be a model of e-government in Senegal. And of course, most of the people are poor, so it's not like we've got a lot of people in this town that are uh, already doing uh, mm. things online, but in some ways that is actually better. It's best to have use case with tiny numbers of users to get out all the bugs. And to take Estonian e-government and somehow patched onto a Senegalese municipality, it's gonna be tricky. You know, I have no idea how we're gonna do this. So this is one where um, if anybody has any idea who wants to help us take Estonian e-government and put it into a municipality of Senegal, uh, let's get working on it. And then if we can get this to work, then of course there are hundreds of thousands of other municipalities across Africa, across the world, and we can then go to, at some point, a nation state. And then we've got a situation where we've got a state of the art e-government you know, just the notary thing. Uh, if we can find a way to have, say, blockchain notary, notaries online instead of a thousand bucks to get something notarized, hello. Uh, but business registration in general, all sorts of finance. And you can imagine anything that's quick and easy here, or, you know, I bet people in this room know ways in which things are becoming quicker and easier in all sorts of domains. We need to get that dynamic going in developing countries so they have instant online access to world-class law and governance. And there are lots of tricky issues. I mean, the criminal law, what do we do with that? Whole different ball game. Um, you know, it gets it gets into lots and lots of details. But one of the ways in which I'm going to go from that to the strongest law thing. Again, I just started calling this. If somebody else knows, somebody who's articulated this better, I'll give it up. But um, so everybody knows, you know, technology gets better, better, faster, cheaper. You know, our iPhones are all miracles. You've all seen the hard disks from the 1960s that are these huge things. Now we, you know, have more than that with our iPhone. So there's this notion that technology gets better, faster, cheaper, but somehow human institutions don't. And I would say, well, yes, right now they don't, but we can change that. So actually this Estonian e-government thing ported to Senegal, obviously we have to have laws changed in Senegal so they're in alignment with the e-government functionality. How do we do that? I haven't gotten that one figured out, but I've got ideas, I've been working with legal experts on this for a long time, so I'm not at ground zero. But it, you could imagine what if we got government to improve at the pace of technology through both uh, fast, quick, easy ways to change government systems, also micro-governments, I think I've got a lot more, that's why we're studying municipality level rather than um, nation state level. 
and lots of experiments with lots of bright people, creating lots of e-governments um, in lots of different ways and developing best practices. You know, I'm sure we don't have the software yet, so obviously software helps. But it's, my, I'm trying to get people to think of a, even something like government in a fundamentally different way um, as something that, you know, I, you know, when I got first met me, she was completely confused because I really think a lot about law, governance, economics, these sorts of issues, but I have almost no interest in politics. Um, I love the Frank Zappa quotation, politics is the entertainment division of the military industrial complex. And you could say, sadly, that's ex exceptionally true right now. But you know, it's a circus, it's just a circus. Meanwhile, we just wanna get things done. You know, I don't care about a lot of political issues. You know, if people wanna have different cultural things, you go do your th culture there, you don't go do your culture there, I don't care. Meanwhile, do I have to pay a thousand bucks to get a document notarized? And let's just deal with some practical stuff. So if we can focus on state of the art, improving certain functional um, systems that ought to be in place so that we can you know, move through government quickly and easily, then let's do it. So I happen to believe uh, that e-government is one example, and government in general, that we can get a system going where we can have endlessly higher quality, endlessly lower cost, and meeting ever more granular needs, um, even in government, human systems. Um, so it's kind of law governance community. Just want to go back to my education world to see how I apply this in education. So right now, co-school is 17,000 a year tuition. The school in San Francisco I'm creating is going to start at 30,000, quickly go up to 40,000. And you think, oh, well, this is you know, ridiculously expensive. How can four kids do that? Yes, it's expensive in part because I have to train everybody from scratch. Uh, you know, I have to create all these systems from scratch. You know, Montessori is starting to get some of these uh, you know, scale factors going, but not a lot, but they will do more. The fact is uh, hiring education majors have no value for me, for me so as, a, as an educator. So if I want to hire somebody, I have to train them completely from scratch because getting a degree in education doesn't help at all. But meanwhile, a lot of the Socratic thing that I do um, and any of you wants to come visit co-school, even though I'm gone, come visit. Um, the Socratics are from 11 to 12 every day. And right now, we have an intermediate and advanced group. The advanced group runs itself, so I do almost nothing. Basically, the kids are in a group like this. Um, you know, we read all sorts of interesting, complex texts, and mostly they run it completely on their own. I think of it as learning clubs. And so I like the idea of creating these autonomous learning clubs that go on their own. Last year, an hour a day was not enough, so they created after-school Socratics, completely student-led, student-supervised, no adult interaction or involvement at all. Um, my online Saturday thing, where I'm trying to get these online learning clubs go so students there again have access, and just to talk about that a little bit, there's a lot of exci excitement about ed tech. I love ed tech, and the fact is only a few people have the patience to sit alone in front of a computer and do a whole different course. What people in the ed tech world haven't really realized is social interaction is everything. We love to talk. And so this Socratic thing where kids are blah, 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 blah. If you can get the, to the point where the talk is productive and constructive and the kids are having fun thinking and talking and arguing about ideas, then all of a sudden, all the ed tech becomes really interesting and useful. Um, just to give you a concrete example of um, how we do world history. So if you look at AP world history, it's about half memorize and forget, I'm great at memorize and forget sorts of things, but half of it are essays. So I'll give you an example of one of the essays in the AP World History exam. One was, there are 10 passages on, from newspapers in 19th century Britain and England, on Britain and India, on the game of cricket. And it's not as if you were supposed to study up on cricket in the 19th century, but you were expected to know about, enough about imperialism and colonialism that you can write a coherent, thoughtful essay in 45 minutes on, uh, the impact of cricket in India based on your knowledge of colonialism and imperialism. So what people don't realize is already at that stage it's big ideas for the most part. And you can score well on the AP exam getting every one of the multiple choice questions wrong if you score really well on the arguing side. Um, I know if somebody once in this world who said that uh, having, getting to have your own ideas and argue for them is kind of the dessert at the end of education. If you're a PhD student, you can have your own ideas and argue for them. Before that, you're supposed to sort of kind of shut up and do what the teacher tells you to do. How horrible is that? And going back to our paleo hosts here, I actually see uh, an element of this which I think of as paleo education. 
in traditional cultures at the age of 12 or 13, you, know, you go out and hunt your first year, you go out and you take adult responsibilities in the community. Um, historically in the US, even in the 19th century, Andrew Carnegie had a job at 13. Thomas Edison was working at 13. Going back to the 18th century, Ben Franklin was out there working at 13. Um, teenagers are amazing, of, 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 capable of amazing things. Uh, there is a wonderful story from something called AskMe.com in the 1990s where um, they had legal advice and one of the top ranked legal advisors was a 15 year old kid. And when the attorneys and the you know, community rating sort of thing, one of, the, one of the attorneys realized it was a kid instead of a real lawyer, they voted him down to the bottom. And when the rest of the community realized the attorneys had ganged up on him and voted him to the bottom, they voted him back up to the top. Um, but it turned out that this kid had had a brother of his was murdered and the, everybody knew who the murderer's, murderer was, but he was not brought to justice. And the kid had become a maniac for watching you know, crime shows on TV and law shows and you know, Judge Duty and all this sort of thing. And as a consequence, he really did know quite a bit about the law and was able to explain it in ordinary, ordinary language. Very different example in terms of uh, standards of maturity. In 1910, a six-year-old boy and a 10-year-old brother rode horseback from Oklahoma to New York City alone. So right now, you know, parents are getting in trouble for having their kids walk to, you know, walk half a mile of school. Back then, cross the country alone. It turns out their father was a cowboy, and uh, you know, the cowboys actually, we think of them as older men. A lot of times the cowboys were 12, 13, 14, and that was normal for kids to take on that kind of responsibility. So I, I think a lot of our, um, oh, let me finish this riff and I'll get you back to this, but a lot of teen dysfunction, quick one on the scale of teen dysfunction, one third of American adolescents are now on prescription medication. About half of that are psychoactive prescription medications, ADHD, um, depression, anxiety, and so forth. I think any normal person from any part of world history would say this is insane that we're medicating you know, a third of our kids and you know, that sort of thing. Um, in addition, that's quite aside from self-medication through substance abuse, which is incredibly uh, prevalent. And then uh, there's a lot of evidence that depression uh, bipolar and schizophrenia are increasing, all of which are adolescent onset. I see adolescence in the United States and gradually around the world, we're just at the cutting edge of this trend, as an absolute catastrophe. It's, uh, you know, I deal with kids all the time that are literally in danger of dying. You know, we haven't even gotten to the girls' self-cutting and uh, eating disorders and, you know, all this stuff. But I think it's because we are infantilizing them. You know, they're human beings designed to be healthy, strong, responsible, mature adults. And we put them in a system where they are passive and humiliated almost every day, all day. Um, I think in traditional cultures, all traditional cultures around the world, there was a sense of virtue and honor. And so you knew what it meant to be a, an example of excellence in that culture. And you were praised by you know, the, the people in your tribe. Um, give you one example. In Alaska, when I was there, there was this you know, six, seventh grade kid who was 6'2". His name was Seagram. He was Native American, named after the alcohol. And um, I, I was having a hard time getting him into the Socratic because you know, everybody else was engaged, but Seagram would always sit there quietly. And one day I just stopped everything and said, Seagram, what do you like? What can we do? What can we talk about the other you like? And after a pause, his eyes lit up and he said, fighting. <laughs> and it turns out that every day after school, he went out on the play or on the parking lot and beat the crap out of the other kids because he was big and strong. <laughs> And, but that, then we started talking about fighting and he was totally engaged and alive and active and enthusiastic and everything. And I realized, you know, in traditional Native American culture, this huge, strong young man, you know, you think, what a walrus hunter have we got. We'd, he'd be celebrated, he would be the hero, everybody would be so proud of him, and he would be showing what a great young man he was in that culture. Instead, he was boxed in under these fluorescent lights with, uh, I'm sorry to say, frightened middle-aged old woman sending him to detention all day. It was insane. And as a consequence, I would not be surprised if he's, you know, lost, lost a teen dysfunction. So for me, I have this real passion for destroying the education system. I say, I love learning, I hate schools. Um, school where the most secondary school were the most boring and cruel years of my life. As an adult, I'm never bored. And if somebody's a jerk, I don't hang out with them. So I'm <laughs> feeling, well, I tell this to kids immediately in rapport, you know, because they're like, hey, he knows, he knows where we're coming from. Um, you know, and, and there are lots of kids who are just miserable out there. And we can create, you know, these small, I'm a big fan of Dunbar's number, communities of 150 or so, these small intimate communities with, you know, tribal norms of excellence and they can be diverse forms of excellence, 
you know, I'm fine with one wants, you know, abstinence education, one wants all sorts of sophisticated sex education. I don't care. We need small tribes of aligned people that are nurturing the diverse parts of the human soul. Um, and finally, going back to the, the Strong's Law, and then I got some questions out here. Going back to once you have the norms in place, it's free. I mean, I, I can educate myself for free using the internet resources. Once these kids have learned how to do this, um, argue about ideas, it doesn't cost anything. They can do this after school for free, online on weekends for free, and then all of a sudden all the ed tech becomes meaningful and valuable once you're in a culture. So kind of pull this up and then we'll really go into questions. With governance, we can have endlessly higher quality, lower cost, more granular, specific sorts of things. And with education, uh, we can create subcultures where learning is normal and fun, excellence is normal and fun, and it becomes costless once you're a member of the subculture and we can get rid of all the prisons uh, that count for secondary schools today. So I will pause and start digging into questions. Go ahead. So um, this is interesting timing because I've been actually looking at um, creating um, some type of 